Hi, everyone. I'm Carlota Pico from the Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here today with Sarah Quansua, who is Get Accepts Digital Marketer and Content Lead and has over three years of experience in marketing and communications. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us today on the Content Mix. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Sarah, we're going to jump right into the interview. To get the interview started off, I'd like to learn a little bit about your background and your experience in marketing and communications. Yes, so I have been at GetAccept for almost a year now. And before that, I've been working as a global web editor and a marketing coordinator. Okay. Uh, and mainly um, in Sweden, but also from England. Uh, but I've always been working in a global uh, a company that works globally. Okay. And what is Get Accept? Yes, Get Accept is uh, it's, uh, it's a startup. It's um, we started 2015, okay. and we are a sales enablement platform, uh, also saying a sales tool that helps people sales people uh, to close the deal faster. Uh, so we provide this platform. It's an amazing platform with a lot of features um, where we do legally finding e-signatures. Um, there is a lot of features uh, where you can track uh, and you can personalize the, the whole sales process and you get data uh, and you can also analyze uh, the sales document, the contracts, the quotes, uh, to see where the deal is getting. Uh, so it's a sales tool, but also a, a sales enablement platform. That's awesome. What are what do you think are the advantages of working in communications and marketing in a startup as opposed to in a multinational? Because obviously the way that you're communicating with your audience is quite different depending on the size of the company and also the history of the company. Yes, for sure. It's a, it's a, it's been an amazing journey since I started. Last year we went from 25 people to 100. Wow. Uh, we are in Europe and US, so and we are um, in four countries in Europe. So it's a mix of uh, culture, uh, people, and it's the atmosphere is just uh, amazing. And it has been an experience, a really nice experience since I started. Um, of course, a challenge. We have uh, meetings early morning and evenings with US, and but that's just the culture, and I really like it. So. That's so exciting. I'm always a big fan of learning about how startups are growing and how they're constantly building their team out and, and learning throughout the process. We will be diving more into that later into our interview. Uh, but to get the interview started, I still would like to learn a little bit about the background of your content marketing strategy at the startup at Get Upset. Get Upset, excuse me. Uh, how, <laughs> what content marketing tools are you using to engage with your audience? So the tools that we are using, the main tool I would say is HubSpot. Okay. Um, and also, as a content creator, um, I, 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 I would say pen and, and paper, but you know, in a digital way, that's what I do. And then I, yeah, I would say HubSpot. That's the two main things I need to be able to do what I'm doing. And then, of course, the whole marketing team we have, you know, Zoom, like we're using now. And um, there's a lot of tools that that is you know, great. Um, but that's, HubSpot is the main tool that I use. Okay. Uh, you briefly mentioned marketing team. I would like to learn about how that marketing team is structured and communications team. Do you do all of your work in house or do you also rely on agencies and partners to help you translate and localize part of this, part of this content? Yes, of course. Uh, so we are, uh, we were three in the marketing team and now we are 11, I think. And we oh. are mainly like the head office is in Sweden, but we have marketing coordinators in Denmark and Norway and, and in the US, of course. Um, so when we create content, uh, we also do the translation on, in-house, I would say. So, and also in the marketing team, we do almost everything in-house. Uh, we have a marketing, uh, VP of marketing, of course, and then we have a social media manager, uh, someone taking care of all the, um, you know, apps um, and also the design and the website. So we have a, 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 a big but small team, a global team working all over uh, Europe and US. Wow. Okay. That must be 
a challenge to manage as well. I would like to talk about the challenges of working in Europe when it comes to marketing and communications. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that question, I'd like to learn about what markets you're currently present in. You briefly mentioned Denmark and Norway. What are the markets are you present in in Europe? So it's uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway, and France. Okay. So that's where we have offices, but then we have customers all over Europe. Are you also targeting those customers in their native languages and according to their culture, or are you primarily pushing out content in the language and and according to the culture of the four markets where you have offices in? Yes, we do. And uh, so, like I said, like in 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 Sweden, we create a lot of, like almost all the content in English uh, and I create also in Swedish, but then uh, we create content for those three other uh, uh, languages uh, as well. Um, but mainly for the, for the whole Europe market, it's, it's English that we, we push. Okay. Awesome. So taking that information into account and obviously taking your role into account, what makes marketing in Europe particularly challenging and also different from marketing in other parts of the world? Hmm. Oh, that's a, a nice question. I would say, for me, a challenge is to, to write in English, but still targeting not one country in Europe, but still targeting the whole Europe. So creating content that, you know, targets... The yeah, whole Europe, basically. Even if, even if we translate to, to some uh, languages, uh, I need I need still need to think about that. Even if I create in English, I'm not talking to an American. Maybe I talk yeah. to a, you know a person in in uh, Portugal or Spain. Uh, so that's a challenge for me to create content that attracts, even if it's not in the local language. Right, like valuable content content that can attract a global audience and can engage with a global audience is particularly challenging when it comes to content creation. Is that a yes. fair summary? Yes. That's okay. <laughs> what about working in Europe in particular makes it so challenging or so exciting at the same time? I don't know, to be honest, but I think like the get accept. Uh, the founders are from Sweden, but it's all started in U.S., Mm-hmm. So we are quite U.S. and bold in the way how we speak. Uh, and that works really good in the U.S. And now we're trying to warm up the market, the European market with our um, taste enablement tool. And I think that's also been one of the, one of the biggest challenges for me. Uh, even if I'm used to work globally, for it, it's, it's still like adapting the needs and the cultures that we have in Europe to attract, and like you said, to create value content. Definitely. Culture. So I think it comes down to culture and the different ways that the audiences engage with content according to their culture and according uh, to their personality. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I am going to quote Steve Olinsky from CMO Network, who recently, well, not recently, but published an article in Forbes in 2017 about content and its significance. He said that content attracts people rather than interrupts them, and that it's important to center content around your audience rather than around your company. Uh, And that's his definition of good content. How are you distributing your content and ensuring that it provides value to your audience versus just advertising your product? So in our content strategy, uh, we always talk about that we are creating uh, inspiring educational content. So of course we talk about our product, but we want to talk, we want to educate Uh, our audience and the market and we want to inspire and also want to talk about people or company that we admire Um, so that's more like I said in the in our content strategy that's the main focus and of course uh, we highlight our products obviously but uh, it's more about educate and to inspire other Okay. What mediums are you using to educate and inspire your audience? For example, do you have a blog going? Do you use webinars? Are you also organizing events? Yeah. So we had a event uh, last uh, autumn, a sales enablement event. Uh, Like I said, we're trying to warm up 
up the European market uh, within sales enablement. It's quite common in the US, but it's still quite new in, in Europe um, and especially in Scandinavia. Uh, so we have events and we also have a lot of webinars and webinars we have on the local level. So we have it in the different languages for each country that we are in. Uh, and then we have a blog and articles, um, and we also create a lot of e-books and white papers to, to, to educate and to inspire. And also when we have the webinars, we interview people that we admire. Okay. I will be moving later on in, in our interview uh, into recommendations uh, and uh, about people that you admire, apps that you constantly use, events that you're always attending. But we'll leave that towards the end of our interview as our rapid fire questions. To finalize this section, I'd like to talk about results and your content marketing related projects that you're particularly proud of. So what does that mean? That means that to touch upon a project, a communications or a marketing project that you've led and I'd like to learn about the purpose, the execution, and the results that you achieved. So, for example, it could be localizing your current website for more markets and translating it into more languages, what that looked like, why you did that, etc. Yeah. So, I think I, I can two projects. One is, like you said, uh, translating or taking the website from global to adapting languages and the cultures. That has been a big challenge. We are still working with that. Uh, and also another product for me, uh, working in a startup company, is to starting from three people in the marketing team and now we are 11. That's also been a really important product to work as a team and to set our goals, to set our KPIs. So... I think that's the two main products that I really you see that in the beginning it's been a challenge, but now it's quite you know I can see the light in the funnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but um, creating content, like I said in the beginning, and then from a global website that we still have, of course, but then creating in, in, into each language and countries that we are uh, are in. What were some of the factors that you took into consideration when it came to adapting your global website for a local audience? I think that's going back to numbers that we could see that people, uh, if we publish something um, for the Norwegian market, uh, we can see that if it's in <laughs> Norwegian, it's people, you know, read and, you know, engage more. That's all come back to like the numbers that we can see that we need to create content uh, in the local languages uh, to get more reach. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Well, I am head of business development at Vera Content, and one of the services that we always offer to our customers is localization and adaptation. Uh, because oftentimes, although, for example, I'm from Spain, but we also work in Latin American markets, and although we speak the same language, our public holidays are completely different and our culture is also very different. So sometimes we, we not only need to translate the content, but if the content is already in the local language, we have to adapt the content according to public holidays, according to personalities and culture. Uh, and that's something that oftentimes many global brands ask us to do because they find it extremely important when it comes to engaging with their local audiences, being able to talk to them according to their cultural um, cultural personalities and cultural preferences. No, I agree. I, I totally agree. Wonderful. Well, moving into the last part of our interview, because unfortunately time is limited, we are going to be looking at rapid fire questions, which is basically your recommendation for other marketing and communication professionals in Europe. So I'd like to start off this section with a lesser known app or tool that you can't live without or that you can't work without. Yes, uh, coming back to HubSpot, but also working with uh, SameRush. And Google Docs, <laughs> it's quite basic, uh, but that's basically what I need uh, okay. as a content creator. Uh, but that's my main tool. And then we work a lot of with uh, Slack. A lot, of, yeah. We do as well. We use yeah. Slack for our internal communications and also our client communications on oh, a daily okay. basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we what use it 
internally. Um, it's really nice. It's a it's a good way. Also now when we were working remotely, it's uh, we can see it's uh, it's uh, increasing on the engagement in Slack as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's a nice way of uh, communicate. Yeah, us as well. Us as well. Going back to HubSpot, what makes HubSpot particularly valuable when it comes to your role? We have our blog in HubSpot, for example. So it's a great tool that, you know, save me time when I publish articles and blog posts. Uh, and also, um, it's a great CRM system. So I think it's, uh, it's um, for a company that is growing, HubSpot is really nice because it's all gathered in the same, uh, in the same platform. Um, so I think it's uh, it's good. We have an, a nice overview and we get analytics, we get numbers. It's helping us as a team and as a company to have a, a base for all the information that we need. Okay, excellent. What about a marketing influencer in Europe that you follow or, for example, hashtags that you follow or topics, stuff that... Uh, other marketing communication professionals and and excuse me, marketing and communication professionals in Europe can also follow and engage with. Uh, I follow a lot of the topics would be sales enablement and also SaaS as we are a SaaS uh, product. So being updated with the latest tech and SaaS news and also within sales enablement. Uh, so I think <laughs> it's, it feels like I'm <laughs> speaking a lot about HubSpot, but HubSpot's blog, I think it's, uh, it's a nice place for me to find inspiration for content. And it's also a nice uh, diversity uh, between the content and in the content. And there's also a uh, source uh, news site, Break It. It's a Swedish one uh, where that I follow and I get the latest updates within the, within the industry. I think that's the two main I'm I'm following. And from a personal point of view, where do you find your inspiration? Because oftentimes I I was a former writer, I'm a former journalist, and sometimes I would face uh, blocks, right? And I I would need to just stop for a second and read uh, uh, read an inspirational story from one of the people that I follow, and that would really help me to refocus, gather my thoughts, and continue writing valuable content. Is there any leader that you're currently following that really inspires you to keep on going and keep on growing? Um, to be honest, no. <laughs> okay, that's a fair answer. <laughs> no, I don't have a specific person, but I have to say that in Get Accept, um, our founders and also a colleague of me, he's a, a really good writer and writes really relevant content. So I think working in, in a startup company, also doing, like I said, interviews and writing a lot of articles about uh, people and companies that we admire, that gives me a lot of inspiration to share and to take part of others' journey or experience. Excellent. Well, we are moving into the last question of today's interview, and that will be a valuable European industry group, association, or event that you constantly attend. It could be digital as well because of coronavirus. So feel free to talk about digital events or digital webinars that provide a lot of value to you. So I do attend uh, some webinars, and it's also coming back to companies that I admire. So there have been a couple uh, this spring that I uh, follow. There is a Finnish company called Vainu. They have a lot of webinars with sales tips and tricks and uh, that I normally listen to. And then, um, yes, I would say an event would be the sales enablement <laughs> event that we are hosting, hopefully, uh, later after the summer, depending on where we're heading with the COVID-19. So this, I haven't, you know, I've been attending to a couple of events, but then COVID came across. So it's a lot of webinars, I would say. Okay, wonderful. Well, that was the last question of today's interview. Those are great insights, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing them with our audience. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) <laughs> and for everybody listening into the contentmix.com, thank you for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you here with us. And for more perspectives on the marketing and communication industry in Europe, 
please tune in to the contentmix.com. We'll be releasing interviews just like this one every week. Thank you again and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.